Jimmy Carter entered the Democratic presidential race a political unknown. Outside of Georgia, hardly anyone even recognized his name. But that would change. You know, I mean, whether he's a peanut farmer or not. I mean, there's nothing wrong with peanuts, as far as I'm concerned. You know? I picture him like one of us. One of the working people, one of the common people. <laughs> So I think the question of Carter is a good one. You know, of all the presidents in history, why is he the one that gets left behind? We're talking about a man who claimed, and probably lived up to it, that while I'm president, I will never tell a lie. Truth be told, Carter was a lot of things. He was the first in his family to graduate high school. He was a Navy nuclear engineer. But most notably, he was a peanut farmer in the very small town of Plains, Georgia, which had about 700 people. I say most notably because I think people have this conception of Carter that he was only a peanut farmer. When in fact, as I said, he was in the Navy for 10 years. He was on a hand-picked Navy nuclear team to develop and research different nuclear projects. In fact, he probably had such a promising career in the field and the only reason you don't hear about him as being a Navy operative is because his dad got sick. His dad being sick literally and fundamentally shaped the rest of his career. He returned to Plains after 10 years of being away. And when he gets back, the South is a little bit different. So he's back in the South in the 1950s, and as everyone knows, especially in light of recent events, the 1950s were, uh, among other things, a time of racial tension in this country. After the landmark case of Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which makes school segregation unconstitutional, you begin to see, in very overt terms, the disdain of white America grow. All across the South, there was a group called the White Citizens Council, which basically wanted to maintain the segregationist status quo, white supremacist status of the South, and the numbers soar there. It even reaches into Plains, Georgia, which again is this remote area. It grew so much that by the time 1958 rolls around and the city is pressuring Jimmy Carter to join, he is the only white male in Plains, Georgia to refuse to join it. The city took such offense to this that they ended up boycotting his family's peanut business. And although Carter survives the fallout from not joining and eventually the boycott ends, he took a pretty big hit from that. After the fallout from this boycott, you begin to see Carter's political life start to take shape. In 1962, Carter runs for the Georgia State Senate and wins. And this is kind of interesting because this is where you sort of begin to see Carter's platform take place. On, on one hand, he is an independent and tough legislator. He often crosses party lines and attacks uh, federal spending. But on the flip side, he's also attacking laws that were put in place to discourage African Americans from voting. I can think of no better example to illustrate his ideals than when it comes to his church. In fact, there is an instance where his church votes to see if they would admit African Americans to worship there. And in an almost unanimous vote against integration, there were three dissenting votes, one of which came from Jimmy Carter, the other of which came from his wife, Rosalind. Admittedly, because he was ahead of his curve for being a white man in the South, this kind of hurt him politically. In 1966, he ran for the governorship uh, in the primary and lost to a very well-known segregationist, Lester Maddox. Maddox was literally one of the South's most racist politicians. He owned a restaurant and he would not let anyone who wasn't white basically eat there. He even distributed ax handles to white people on entry which became a symbol for white people against integration. And Carter sort of realized that if he wanted to have any political clout in the South, he would have to reshape his stances and, and moderate a little. And herein lies the problem with electoral politics. 
you know, to what extent do you moderate your stances or compromise your values so that you are electorally relevant? He changed his stance on busing, which enabled him to secure endorsements actually from Lester, but from other prominent segregationists in the South. However, in his inaugural address, he stated that segregation should end and actually surprised a lot of Georgians and of course the whole nation really. I say to you quite frankly that the time for racial discrimination is over. One of the more progressive things he does off the jump is increase the amount of African Americans in Georgia's government by about 25%. He also encouraged environmental protections and secured funding for schools, but it did come at another cost because it did not align with any traditional democratic policies at that time. Remember, we're talking about a different political context of the South. Carter figures that he might as well test his luck elsewhere. And so after watching George McGovern, who is largely painted as a radical extremist from the left, after he watches him get his ass kicked, he figures, well, let's moderate and let's go and try and win the presidency. In essence, Carter runs on the idea that following Watergate, not only do we need someone who can restore faith in the government in America, but we also need someone who can be trusted. And so who more to trust than a political outsider from the South? One crucial thing to think about in this election cycle was that he was virtually unknown to everyone. He even got the nickname Jimmy Who. But after primary win and primary win and primary win, he does eventually secure the nomination. And to sort of make amends with the more left-leaning side of the party, he picks Walter Mondale as his running mate. To be honest with you, Carter and Mondale absolutely had the upper hand. Primarily because Watergate had just occurred with Nixon, so of course he resigns. And then Gerald Ford takes over as president and then pardons Nixon. So the country's in an uproar. In fact, Carter opens the race with double-digit leads over Ford. But he has one problem. As weird as this sounds, and yes, it was a problem, I guess, for the 70s, uh, he was portrayed as being basically too good of a guy. I think there was this sense that, that Carter carried this holier-than-thou uh, sort of perception because of, of his faith, because of the way he treated people, and just his general views about the world and politics. To fix this issue, Carter takes a little bit of an unprecedented uh, play. He actually sits down with Playboy for an interview and basically says that he's committed adultery in his heart. Well, I find this funny as hell. I guess voters really didn't in the 70s, and it, it, it was a gaffe by all means, but it did not cost him the election. He still ends up beating Gerald Ford. Although Carter's presidency often gets overlooked because of the Iran hostage crisis and basically a very stagnant economy that had high gas prices and high inflation, there were actually some noteworthy things that he did achieve. Measured economically in a very holistic way, Carter could claim about 8 million jobs added under his administration, and the federal budget deficit actually did increase in terms of gross national product. From an environmental lens, he was actually the first president to install solar panels on the White House roof. He expanded the national park system, and he created the Department of Energy. On top of all of that, he also created the Department of Education, he bolstered Social Security, and he actually appointed a record number of non-white folks to government positions. Perhaps his most noteworthy accomplishment while in office was his mediation of the Camp David Accords, which was between Israel and Egypt. In essence, uh, Israel agreed to return lands that they took from Egypt in a 1973 war between them, and in return, Egypt fully recognized Israel diplomatically. Carter also brought a sense of the common man to the White House. He actually banned the hail to the chief to play at any appearance that he had. And he also sold the presidential yacht. And yes, we had a yacht at one point. That being said, Carter could not overcome the eventual tide of Reaganism. He lost to Ronald Reagan in 1980, and he did return to Plains in a very saddened and disheartened manner. However, in true Carter fashion, he didn't just stop there. 
After his loss, he formed the Carter Center, which is world-renowned for its advancements of human rights globally. Carter has since traveled to over a hundred countries and in fact has actually helped cure guinea worm disease, which was largely due to a lack of access to clean water. In 2002, Carter was even awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his decades of work and untiring effort to find peaceful solutions to international conflicts, to advance democracy and human rights, and to promote economic and social development. As Carter relates to 2020, he actually is still alive. He is, in fact, the oldest living president ever. Carter currently is 95 years old and has survived a plethora of health issues, most notably his metastatic melanoma that spread to his liver and brain, but he did survive. And politically, there are really two main takeaways from Jimmy Carter as it relates to 2020. The first being that Jimmy Carter does not like Donald Trump. He is often critical of it. He tries not to break traditional presidential uh, protocol, which is that you don't comment on former administrations, but he doesn't really like him. It's bound to come in our country through the electoral process. And I think that uh, America will learn from its mistakes. We don't always elect the best person. That's obvious, I think, including the time when I ran, perhaps. But I think America eventually prevails. The second thing, though, is that this whole notion that the whole moderate progressive relationship uh, is something new is obviously not the case. Uh, something that was sort of interesting about Carter is that there was a so-called ABC movement, the anyone but Carter. It basically come from, came from the more left side of the party. Um, and you might see that same idea manifest with Joe Biden in 2020. There are obviously a lot that are a little bit further on the left that are not so excited about his, his candidacy, but we have yet to see how that's gonna play out. While I understand that Carter's presidency and his administration did come with a lot of hoops and a lot of unfortunate things, I will say that he does get unfairly treated in, in the history books. I don't think he should be a forgotten president. And as far as the moral aspect of, of being president goes, I don't think you get any better than him. So to Jimmy Carter, thank you for your years of service. Thank you for everything that you've done and keep on fighting, man.